Welcome to the first vodcast, vidcast, podcast, what's the other one? Vlog about the Now English Club. This time we're focusing on Dai Sijia. Sijia. I think that's how you pronounce it. Dai Sijia, he's a Chinese author, wrote this book in the year 2000. Uh, it's called The Little Chinese Seamstress. I've just read it. Uh, I'm going to give you some notes on that very subject. I don't know how useful these will be, but really these are geared up in particular for uh, students who are studying English literature at GCSE level. OK, so what, what do we note first of all about it? Well, let's not forget it's a translation. Um, that's very important. Um, and um, as a result, obviously, some things do get lost in translation inevitably. The narrator interestingly never actually names himself so he is always known as the narrator although um, he writes in the first person of course so doesn't really have to refer to himself but he uh, there is one part which I'll come to later where he actually uh, gets close to revealing his name if you're a Chinese reader um, if you're if you can actually read Chinese and perhaps you could have worked out what his name probably is Anyway, the main character, apart from the narrator, is is a, is a boy called Luo, and Luo is 18 years of age, and the narrator is 17. They're city boys who are sent uh, to a village for re-education. This is something that happened during the Cultural Revolution in in China. And this actually happened to Dai Zijia, and therefore it's autobiographical. The uh, village headman is the uh, antagonist, if you like, he inspects the violin that uh, is owned by the narrator, and he describes it as a toy. He wants to burn it. He's got three blood spots in his eye. Um, this is part of his characterization, a very important part. And, um, well, the other thing, of course, is uh, Luo um, makes, makes it into a humorous situation and tells, uh, tells the, head vill uh, the village headman that... Um, the, uh, he, he's going to play Mozart, and uh, a song called Mozart thinks of Mao all the time. That being Chairman Mao, of course, the instigator of the Cultural Revolution. And another, another, another joke um, with Cultural Revolution, I might add at this point, took place about 1968, and um, the setting for this novel is 1971. That's the initial setting, anyway. Um, and then the action takes place over around about uh, two years. And uh, they they also allude to a textbook, um, a revolutionary textbook with a peasant woman um, on the front cover. Apparently, she was on the front cover of many of these textbooks, and she's got a red uh, headscarf on, which to them looks like a sanitary towel. Um, I'll show you my edition. Uh, it's a vintage uh, copy. Uh, that's on page seven. That particular joke. So I've got this from the library. Anyway, so um, their parents, that's Luo and the narrator, their parents were labelled as enemies of the people, which is why they were shipped off, not really physically shipped, but sent off anyway to, to the countryside. And um, the, they were guilty of, uh, well, Luo's father uh, fixed Mao Zedong's teeth, and um, I think he had the audacity to, to make comments about it, and therefore he was... Um, he was punished for it. He had to admit that he'd slept with the nurse, and um, the narrator feels very sorry for Luo's father and starts to cry. And Luo actually punches him at this point. And you might get asked why um, did um, Luo punch the narrator? And of course, that's very debatable. Uh, Luo's, I mean, the narrator's parents were also in the medical profession. They were actually doctors. So that's chapter one pretty much wrapped up. Chapter 2 is when they, um, you hear about their banishment to the phoenix of the sky, um, the only westerner that's ever penetrated that region in the past was Father Michel, and uh, there's some quotes from his uh, almost like travelogue of the place. Then we hear about Luo's tiny rooster clock, which was much venerated by everyone in the, uh, in the village, and um, and then the, you hear about the horror of the back buckets where they're carrying all kinds of slop. Uh, and it's it's quite disgusting, that uh, description. We also hear about Lua's brainwave of uh, readjusting the time on the clock to get a bit more sleep. So a bit more humour there. And um, we also hear about the uh, 
the way that the um, the village is constantly veiled in a thick sinister mist that's on page 15 uh, I think this is an illusion uh, or an allegory it's an allegory um, to communism really um, the narrator plays um, a Tibetan song and Luo dances um, and, then, and then there's talk about um, the narrator believing he's got a, a three and a thousand chance of escaping the drudgery that he's uh, been enforced upon him uh, but Luo's true genius is not dancing, it's for storytelling, acting out films that he's seen in Yongjing village. He does that to the headman, and so that a new career almost beckons away from the fields because they're hating, they're really hating the kind of work they're doing there. In chapter three, we meet the princess of Phoenix Mountain with her pink canvas shoes, hence the picture. That's all we see of the princess. You see the white socks as well and the pink canvas shoes. And... Um, Anyway, uh, even though those shoes are uh, homemade and cheap, um, they are feminine and she's got a certain amount of natural beauty. She's in fact not a princess but the tailor's daughter. But he, the way the way he's being treated is almost like a king. He in fact lives like a king as um, quote on page 21. He's, um, he's carried around in a sedan chair. Uh, it's like a, re a regal conveyance. And... Um, He's almost mythical. His voice was like a clap of thunder we hear on page 22. And, um, of course, um, the Luo and uh, the narrator are both, um, are both attracted to her. But Luo managed to, uh, manages to steal a march on his friend by um, saying to the seamstress that, um, that he bets that he has something in common with her. And then um, he gets her to remove her shoe and... Lo and behold, she has a, has, um, a longer second toe than, um, than, than her um, big toe. And um, not everybody has that, obviously, but Luo does, and so does the seamstress. And um, so she loses her, the bet, and then she has to adjust his trousers for free. Of course, she adjusts his trousers in other ways later on in the story. And, um, of course, uh, looking at her sewing machine, you might say a made-in-Shanghai sewing machine... Um, harks to the city um, and there's a certain amount of foreshadowing going on there and um, also is um, a mark of civilization but uh, the seamstress believes that she's uncivilized but we'll come to that later chapter four we see uh, Luo the naked coal miner he's um, saying he's going to die in the mine at that point uh, on reading it, I thought this was foreshadowing his death, but in fact, that didn't happen, although he did get malaria, so he gets quite close to death. Uh, the men try to whip the sickness out of him with willow and peach branches. Um, that's on page 30. And then the narrator finds a letter from, uh, lit from the little seamstress to Lua, um, and clearly the love, the love between them is flourishing. And... Um, Anyway, chapter five, Lu, uh, Luo and the narrator go to see the the little flower seller. Everything seems to be little in this book, but they go to see the little flower seller, which is a North Korean film. It's um, a sentimental film, but um, the key line is a sincere heart can make even a stone blossom. Um, and uh, this really upsets everyone when they retell the story. So tell me, was the flower girl's heart lacking in sincerity? Um, we hear more about the storyline a bit later. But uh, Luo um, has this confident air of a conqueror, we hear, despite his bouts of malaria. And they arrive at the little seamstress's home. And um, the black dog is silent. There might be, um, maybe you get asked questions about that and uh, what does that black dog represent? And um, the reason he doesn't bark, we've heard in a previous chapter, is that the little seamstress says that it's not to her taste for, for the dog to bark. Uh, what does that say about her character? I'll leave you to think about that one. Anyway, uh, Luo's very sick with malaria, so she makes a poultice for him and puts him to bed. Um, she's very ignorant. She thinks worms cause toothache. Uh, but... She's still a little bit sceptical about natural remedies. She says you can't believe in them totally, but you can't deny them totally either. It's a bit like um, an agnostic's view of faith, really. Um, and then um, 
she seems to relate to religious faith because she asks if Luo's father is Buddhist, and uh, the narrator says that Luo's, Lu, Luo's father got rid of all the worms in Chairman Mao's teeth to try and uh, try and put um, the little seamstress's mind to rest. Her reply is quite respectful, and she asks, "Would um, would Luo's father mind if she recruits some sorceresses to try to uh, try to cure Luo?" Anyway, the narrator tells the flower girl story. It doesn't get any reaction from the sorceresses at all. Um, the story is the daughter's money um, in the flower girl story. The daughter's money comes too late to save her mother in hospital, and Luo. Um, on his what seems to be his deathbed, actually interrupts, and uh, this interruption causes the sorceresses to cry, and it also results in the little seamstress planting a furtive kiss on Lua after the lamp goes out on page 38. Again, I thought that must foreshadow death, but again, it wasn't the case. Then we reach part two, chapter six. It's a, all about four eyes. Um, we've had a quick mention of him before. But we hear much more about Four, Four Eyes. He's 18 years of, of age. Of course, he wears spectacles. And uh, he's a bit lower down Phoenix Mountain. And the three of them together are like a gang of three. That's, uh, that's um, um, that actually alludes to the Communist Party. There were a gang of three um, in the Communist Party in China. So look that up. Um, and um, he's got a mysterious suitcase, and they are uh, Luo and the narrator are are speculating about what's in it. Uh, Four Eyes' father is a writer, and his mother is a poet. And um, well, he's um, he he's um, having problems with his buffalo; it knocks his glasses off. It's almost like agriculture is winning against the intellectuals. Uh, that's what I find that to be representative of. Um, his suitcase gave off a whiff of civilization. And uh, it's fastened with locks in three places, and uh, Luo correctly guesses that books are hidden inside. And um, it also seems that um, the little seamstress's uh, poultice of broken bowl shards has proved effective, so the malaria subsided now. And um, there's a lot of speculation about what is actually contained in that mystery suitcase. Um, they even speculate Luo and the narrator that it could be a Bible. Luo thinks it could be Don Quixote. Uh, it's all about an old knight errant. That is a theme that comes up again later on. Don Quixote was a satire written um, in 1605 to 1615, so pretty old, um, and um, yeah, a satire about a knight. And um, up until then, they really didn't know a lot about Western literature. All they'd come across was Enver Hoxha, an Albanian communist leader's book. That's all. That's all that people around there knew about uh, the West in terms of literature. So um, anyway, Four Eyes' lenses become broken. We don't really find out how. Um, and he fears that this physical deficiency could be disastrous for him. And um, then um, he gives them the Balzac book, uh, Luo and, um, and the narrator, because they help.